Welcome, Margaret, at the uh, Collaborative Research Center Origin and Function of Meta Organisms. Uh, due to the COVID 19 pandemic, uh, we do that uh, online. It's uh, 9 p.m. here in Kiel and it's uh, 10 a.m. in Hawaii. It's fantastic to have you uh, as our guest. Uh, you are the leader of the host micro beneficial bacteria host interaction field and uh, member of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute professor. Uh, you are also a member, a highly appreciated member of our scientific advisory uh, board. And uh, in June 2016, at the opening conference of our research center, you remember, we already had the chance to talk to each other. And the first question um, at that time I asked you was, where do you see the significance of this research field and of understanding uh, host microbe interactions in general? What is your answer today, four years later? I still feel that, um, that an understanding of how animals uh, and other organisms interact with the microbial world is probably the largest revolution in biology uh, since Darwin. So our view of the biological world uh, being technology enabled, um, you know, with next generation sequencing, we've seen that the uh, biological world uh, is principally microbial. The greatest diversity is invested in the microbial world and that becomes clearer and clearer every day. Uh, and uh, the health of all dimensions and all aspects of the biosphere rely on the microbial world. And, um, you know, this is a huge change, a huge change. And, you know, what, what I'm reminded of is I'm reminded of um, in physics, when they, uh, there was a change from Newtonian physics to quantum physics uh, in the 20th century. That was a true revolution. It changed the face of that field uh, forever. And I feel similarly that uh, we have had three revolutions in biology um, in the last 150 years or so, uh, a little more. Um, and they are, um, you know, uh, natural selection, the theory of evolution, and um, <clears throat> by Charles Darwin uh, is the principal player there. Um, and then uh, in the 1950s, of course, was the recognition of DNA as the um, genetic material. And what I feel in the um, beginning of the 21st century, what we've done is we've melded those two things together. Um, in other words, we're showing, um, using genes um, to uh, divine relationships among organisms. And what that has shown us uh, is, is the vastness of the microbial world. Uh, and so I feel like we're on the bow wave of a very, very, very significant um, change uh, in view in biology. Um, it's, it's an interesting time because I've been in situations with extremely uh, famous, knowledgeable people who just say it's a fad. And I will say to them, it's the way the biological world works. And in fact, it's, it's such an amazing change in viewpoint and part of the problem is that beginning in the 1950s, biology began to embrace molecular biology so strongly that biology went into strong silos. So people could get a biology degree from a cell and molecular biology department and not even know or understand the organism that they were working on <laughs> and, and how it evolved and, and what it really was at the organismal level. Similarly, people could get degrees in ecology and evolution and not know the basis for how the, the sort of molecular and genetic basis for how that animal really did evolve. So there, the, the field is challenged 
uh, with the senior people, particularly um, in the field, being very wedded to silos in which they find themselves and trying to pull themselves back out and look down and incorporate into their thinking um, that, that animals are nested communities of microorganisms that are then nested within ecosystems. It's a very big change. Um, but I still firmly believe that, that that's the way the biological world works. Yes. Before we continue on that, let's go back to the initial question, and uh, which I asked you four years ago. But now, so certainly the question is very, still very important and significant, and maybe becoming a real, the fundamental question of biology of this century. Do you see, or where do you see that the field has developed in the last four years, and uh, in which directions? Biology, medicine, are there new developments which happened recently? Yeah, I think probably some of the most amazing developments, what we did for probably <clears throat> the, the next 10 years after next-gen sequencing happened, the vast majority was asking the question, who's there? You know, who's there? Because the, the communities of microbes are typically highly complex. And so trying to get a handle on how that complexity is established, how it's maintained, how it changes over the trajectory of the life history of, a, of an animal is really important. Describing who's there is continuing and will continue probably forever. The most recent findings, of course, um, that I think are truly shocking are in cancer biology, where um, it's been shown that most tumors have a very predictable microbiome associated with them. And the cancer biologists are like a deer in the headlights. It's like, where did this come from? And it's a, it's a really, really amazing phenomenon. What I think has happened um, in a lot of the field, however, is it, they've moved from asking who's there to looking at mechanisms and trying to understand how an animal chooses a specific microorganism when it's born. And so, for instance, when a baby is born, it does not choose a random sample of the environment. It, it has develops during embryogenesis the ability to interact uh, its cells to interact with a specific subset of, of the environmental bacteria that, that it inter, with which it interfaces. Uh, and so, you, you know, you want to know how that happens. Then you want to know the extent to which and how deeply the bacterial partners interface with and control the biology of the host. Um, how do they control development? How in the world do they become stable? We have an immune system and the immune system is thought to be the interface between uh, the host organism and its microbial partners. And so you ask the question, how is it that these microbes talk to these beneficial uh, uh, microbes that you keep you know, most of your life? How do, how, does, how do those bacteria talk to the host to keep them from getting rid, the, the host getting rid of them. And likewise, how does the host keep them from overgrowing the situation? And what in the world is the difference between a microbial pathogen and a beneficial symbiont? And so all these sorts of mechanisms and all these sorts of questions people are beginning to get into. And, and I think um, I, you know, obviously I study a model system, um, a very simple one uh, with one host and one microbe. And, and I feel that when biologists have been faced with very, very complex things, one of the, the strategies is to find experiments that nature has done that are very simple and have, you know, when an animal has been faced with living with a bacterium persistently, how does it do it? And so just as in developmental biology, where we learned a lot from the fruit fly and, and the worm and the zebrafish and so on, um, in symbiosis, which is even more complex uh, often, how do we um, 
you know, learning about these sorts of things will require the use of, of a whole array of model systems. And in my opinion, we haven't even touched the tip of the iceberg in developing those model systems. I think there are many, many more out there that will teach us things that we couldn't get any other way. Related to that, and uh, but maybe a little more focus, a uh, very simple money question. Is there still not entered territory in our field? And I give you the keyword biogeography. Is there an, a, uh, an, uh, an area in our research field which is not yet touched at all? You have mentioned many, but would you think that there is something which is really not yet touched at all? So um, I, I think that um, we are still challenged with, with understanding and being willing to embrace the depth to which the microbes um, affect the host. Mm -hmm. So uh, along about 2012 or so, eight years ago, I was at a meeting in San Diego um, and there were a bunch of, you know, very, very, very distinguished neurobiologists there. And I was saying that, you know, microbes are the base of biology. And they said to me that I should recognize that microbes have nothing to do with the brain. And that was only eight years ago. And I can tell you that that field is now exploding. And I think that there are going to be lots of fields like that. I just was asked um, to give a talk to a medical school cardiology department. And so I went and looked to see how much money and how much focus in the United States there is on cardiology. And it's very, very low. And so I think that, um, that there's the issue of finding um, groups finding out how it affects their own little backyard their own little area. And then the challenge is to try to bring the whole thing together. None of these things are independent. And I think that's a huge, huge challenge is trying to, to bring it all together so that we understand things in a more holistic way. One of the things that it's done is it's taken us back to what I call organismal biology. And that is that Biology is not about chemistry. <laughs> chemistry is at its base and physics is at its base. Uh, and many mechanisms are explained that way. But, but biology is about organisms, whether they be single cell bacteria or they be, and, and how they work, how systems work. And I think that's a, that's a huge thing. Within our field itself, if you go to animal biology, there is still no situation in which there's really good genetics in all partners. And because most of the time they're really complex. So in the plant world, I should say, the leguminous plant rhizobium symbioses are, they're the, the basis of the very finest symbiosis research out there. And we don't have anything like that in the animal world. And we are unlikely to have it very often. Um, and <clears throat> because the fact of the matter is, is even though that'll be useful in binary associations, in animals, that's not the most common way in which microbes associate with animals. They typically associate in very complex consortia. So, you know, there's, that's something that I think we're going to grapple with. Along these lines, is the time already there for translation? Or is it much too early? I think of two aspects. One, starting with your research on the circadian rhythms and all the problems shift workers have and uh, time zone changings have. And we all know that there is a microbial component. And the second aspect, of course, which is obvious and many people look at us is probiotics. Would you say that despite all the limitations and the still early days, is it time for translation or not yet? Yeah, I think that I think that that it is time for translation. Uh, the probiotic situation continues to be very challenging, and the part of the reason is because there are so many strain differences uh, in organisms that are uh, typically used in probiotics, 
And um, uh, so, but I do think that there are certain situations uh, that, that really call for, um, for use of microbes to ameliorate the situation. I mean, we ought to enlist um, our normal microbiota um, in, in uh, making sure that we're as healthy as we possibly can be. Uh, and then, but I do think it's time for translation and beginning to understand how we can, I mean, Clostridium difficile infection is the most obvious one. And, you know, people are working to get pills that, that people can take to, to reestablish and compete with the Clostridium difficile infection that can kill people. At this point, um, as, as we know, the, the, the way that that's treated is by fecal transplant. And that's, that's fraught with all kinds of problems. And so um, I think we, we really, I think it should be a huge focus in medicine. Uh, because I think, um, and, it, and it should be coupled with nutrition. Talking about medicine, talking about in these days, we cannot ignore talking very shortly about the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, the majority of our colleagues are now focused on that virus. Does the COVID-19 research impact the research on beneficial microbes and hosts? What's your opinion? I think that there's no question that the beneficial microbes and the, the um, the array of microbes that a given individual has will influence their proclivity toward a serious infection of COVID-19 or not. Mm -hmm. And that is reflected very, very straightforward way in that people who are obese and people who have type 2 diabetes and people who have pre-existing autoimmune conditions, all of which are linked to dysbiosis of the microbiota. Um, all of those groups have a uh, very bad prognosis uh, for COVID-19. Um, and so I think that um, what we have to start thinking, um, Thomas, I really feel strongly that we have to start thinking of the whole system as an ecosystem. And each part of that ecosystem contributes to the outcome of any situation. And so that, um, you know, uh, just a, a small example that I think is really dramatic is uh, Skip Virgin at Washington University showed that the latent carriage of herpes virus, in other words, carrying herpes, but not having a full-blown herpes infection, but you just, a lot of people carry herpes um, and the carriage of herpes confers heightened resistance to a whole series of mm. infections. Mm. And so our, our, we have this, these microbes with us that we've evolved with us that tune our immune system in such a way. And we know that COVID-19 um, is something that um, goes after the immune system. You know, it, at first you have a mild reaction and then you have a cytokine storm you know, several days later. And, and I think the outcome is very dramatically influenced by um, whether or not we have dysbiosis with our microbiome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I fully agree. I mean, we have to go back to a holistic understanding which biology and medicine had uh, decades ago, and, uh, but we lost for some reason. But now we are at a topic which many people are interested in, of course, many educated people on outside academia brings me to science communication. Nice to have or an essential part of our job? Yeah, I think it's an absolutely, it's absolutely essential. Um, you know, it's, it's very interesting because the people, at least in the United States, who are the most resistant um, or the group that I have found is very resistant to um, embracing the microbiome in, in human health or the physicians in the medical profession. And it could be just a thing in the United States because the United States is so litigious. Everybody's getting sued all the time. <laughs> um, but they, they are um, very, they're very cautious about it. 
On the other hand, when I get on an airplane and I sit down and the person next to me says, what do you do for a living? I often say I work on the role of beneficial bacteria in health. And oh my goodness, Thomas, for the next two hours, that person is so curious, asking me questions, asking me, because I believe that the public really is beginning to understand this and they're hungry. And I think that it's our job um, to tell them, you know, what's going on and why, why it's happening now. I mean, that's one of the most common questions is why is this coming out now? And it's coming out now because the field was technology enabled to be able to identify the microbes and learn what they do. And it's a huge change in the last 14 years that was enabled by that change in, in, uh, in technology. Yeah, yeah, fully agree. C coming back to something you mentioned earlier, and that is uh, when we are trying to now see uh, the bigger picture without losing the depths of the detail. I mean, and your work is a beautiful example of how you do uh, state-of-the-art, very deep uh, investigations, but then to see how a complex system really works, that needs people from very different disciplines. And uh, so you are working with mathematicians and with modelers and with physicists, etc., etc. But as you mentioned earlier, I mean, still the traditional academic institutions are very much departments, silos, uh, this discipline and that discipline, and even worse, our curricula are very discipline oriented. And uh, so what you suggest, uh, how can we change that? We need a young generation which is educated and sees the depths and sees the benefit of redu reductionistic approaches, but on the other side, knows how to engage a mathematician or a physicist or an artist or a philosopher in this question. How, how, I mean, how you want to change that? You got, uh, you got a, a fellowship uh, from the Moore Foundation to to uh, to to engage in that question and finding a solution. You have a solution how to get to a more disciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary training of our yeah. junior investigators. I feel very, very, very strongly that that the way to do the science itself is to be highly collaborative. You want the very best person. Um, you want the very best person working with you on a particular aspect um, that you, you know, don't know anything about. But I do feel very strongly that um, education is going to be the answer and the education of the young people. And I mean, think about this fact that um, I don't know about you, Thomas, and I don't know so much about the way things are taught in Europe, of course, but in the United States, um, uh, all biologists have to take chemistry and physics. And um, I went back and looked at my chemistry and physics textbooks from when I was a kid, you know, many years ago um, when I took those courses as an undergraduate. Um, and then I took the books of physics and chemistry of today and saw that the table of contents, the big table of contents is identical. So those fields have divined a basic set of principles that all biology or all physicists and all chemists should know. And so what they do is they start off by teaching you those principles. And so what has happened in biology is completely different. What you have is you have a textbook that's 1,270 pages and every time you find something new, you stick it in there somewhere and it's just bricolage. It's just this big collage um, that, that doesn't necessarily hang together. And it often starts, they all often start with chemistry. The most, you know, the, chem, the book will say, okay, what are the building blocks? And so um, uh, what you're talking about, Thomas, was with the Moore Foundation. I was a Moore professor at Caltech. And what I did with Diane Newman was, she's a professor at Caltech in geomicrobiology, is we started um, an introductory biology course that was the first of its kind, a brand new one, in which microbiology was the starting point of every topic. And so if you do that, um, a student will understand the history of the biosphere. They'll understand the metabolic scope of the biosphere. They will understand um, everything. And so she would stand up and say, okay, how do bacteria behave? Well, they behave by sensing something. They integrate that across their cell and then they swim somewhere or something like that. Just this one cell. You have sensing, integrating, and, and moving. 
Um, and in, in our bodies, we have three kinds of neurons. We have sensory neurons, inner neurons that integrate across our body, and we have motor neurons that cause us to do whatever we do um, in response to that environmental change. So that concept of behavior goes, is, all in, is through all organisms. So if you go back to basic organisms and the way organisms work, and you look at basic principles, not a huge amount of memorization. Biology, intro bio has been all this memorization. But there are, there are basic principles that you can use to create a super strong foundation so that you will, when you walk out of an intro, a year-long introductory biology course, you will know everything from the history of the biosphere and it, evolution all the way down into the molecular mechanisms and back up into physiology and into the ecology of those organisms and how they function in populations and communities. And you will walk out as a biology major and then you specialize, you go into cell biology, you go into, not only that, but that course, just like, you know that the physicists and chemists rarely take intro bio. With the intro with the biologists, I took introductory chemistry and physics with the with the chemistry and physics majors, and so we need to have engineers and chemists and physicists and mathematicians sitting in the same room with our biology majors, taking these foundational courses that talk about the basic underlying mechanisms of biological systems, and so I'm really feel strongly, obviously, that, that, that education is the answer to, to um, this, this siloing that we have in biology and the problems we have. You know, working with, you know, I have to say, Thomas, I worked with um, some mathematicians um, in engineering at Caltech, uh, Ava Conso, and talking to Ava Conso was incredibly difficult because she had no biology background, none. And so I had to, she's a fabulous mathematician. And I just had to, it was a, it was a tremendous adventure um, trying to connect. And obviously we connected um, through a very, very talented graduate student at Caltech, Yana Nauroth, um, and who then went off um, uh, to, to Harvard to work as a postdoc um, but we connected through someone who had that integration. And so, you know, I know it can be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, staying in the same room, but not now as an academic teacher who tries to leave the silos behind, but looking at the student. We come to the end of our chat, and, uh, but I want to spend a few minutes and getting your thoughts about what you would recommend for a, for a an interested, enthusiastic, motivated young person, how to prepare best for an academic career these days uh, in, um, uh, when, when she or he enters a, a university? What are the advices you would give to a young person? So I would strongly advise um, young people, this is just obviously my opinion, um, to go to college not thinking that it is a way to get a job, but rather a way to become a very, very well-rounded humanist. And um, I think that um, no matter what major you decide to go into, whether it be biology, chemistry, physics, understanding um, philosophy, I think, is very important. Understanding why we think the way we think understanding metaphysics or thinking about thinking <laughs> and, and ethics, you know, these core values um, and, and logic. I mean, all these things I think create a scholar and, and give you wings to be as thoughtful in the career that you choose, whether it be in the humanities or it be in sciences. I think that all humanities students should take science. They should have, um, it should be a, a set of requirements. You can't, um, all the problems of mankind have biology at their base. And so you have to know and understand 
um, biology at some level in order to be an effective citizen. Um, and so I, I think that um, they should, no one understands society. They should, you know, in other words, I feel that college is to become well-rounded. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to be a, a technologist or you want to be, you know, um, you want to, you know, go after something where you're going to be guaranteed a job, um, that's a completely, that's, you know, technical school. Yeah. I think a college is to teach you um, to be a humanist. And then within that, you will gain insight into where your strengths are and where you ought to go in your career. And you'll be most successful, I think, if you're well-rounded. Yeah, very well said. Um, turning to a particular group of students, women. Our research field is full of powerful and successful women. You are one of them. What would you advise to a female young investigator to prepare best for the career? I, I would say that um, you should be, there's no, uh, there's no substitute for excellence in paying attention to what counts. And that is, you know, getting very, very good publications out. And my feeling is that if you hit a brick wall with some guy who's not going to let you go where you need to go, or some woman, it happens both ways, you just work around it. You go in a different direction. In my career, you know, obviously I'm a senior person, and in my career, I found that women are particularly good pioneers. And I think that has to do with the fact that um, in, in the field, without being too dichotomous, you can either be um, a bandwagon person. In other words, you jump on a field that's very highly competitive. You're in, on the streets of Manhattan in a tuxedo and you're, you know, you're very competitive. Or you're out on the plains of Kansas with a sickle as a pioneer. Um, in other words, you're, you're making new ground, you're, you're finding new things. And I think because women have been often kept out of the really competitive areas, they um, have been very, very, very good pioneers. My, um, you know, it's, it's really interesting. A movie just came out on a series of American women scientists, one from MIT, one from UC San Diego, and one from, from a university in Texas talking about the history of their, of their struggles um, with, with being in a, in a gender that has not been well appreciated. Mm. And I can tell you that I have stories that go on forever mm. <laughs> about that. I can tell you story after story. Um, and one of the things I find is that one of the problems I think is that people like their name to be remembered. And if you spend 10 minutes on that, you've wasted your time because ask anybody who the Nobel laureate was from five years ago and they won't remember. <laughs> and so I think the important thing is to do good work and have fun. Very good said. Uh, but tell us for the very end and the last question, one more personal story. We are just now there. You are so energetic. You are so interactive. Where do you get your energy from? What keeps you going? I think that what keeps me going is I feel so lucky to be in a field that is at the frontier where working with people like yourself, Thomas, you know, I look at you, Thomas, and, and you know, it wasn't, 13 years ago that you published your first paper on symbiosis. And, you know, you were trained as a developmental biologist and, and the, our field has some of the very best people in each of the sub-disciplines coming into it and saying, oh my gosh, there's a whole frontier out there. So what keeps me energetic is, first of all, in my own, in my own work, trying to figure out how this ridiculous thing works. <laughs> it's so complicated for such a simple thing. Um, but 
you know, the awe that I, that I have for our field. I mean, it's just the most amazing thing to watch it grow and to watch, you know, the young people. Uh, it's such a young field. And, and to be a senior person in a young field is just the very best. And uh, so I think, you know, it's, it's, I went to a Jesuit university and at this Jesuit university, we were required to take, we had two things. We had to be a philosophy minor, which I was a biology major philosophy minor. And we had two courses we had to take and they were economics. This was Jesuit, remember, um, economics and speech. And I went to the head of the biology department and I said to the head of the biology department, I will never speak in front of a crowd. So I would like my speech requirement waived. And they waived my speech requirement. <laughs> and so today, it's, it's such a funny thing for me to think back um, at, at an opportunity to learn how to speak better than I do um, when I was in college and foregoing that and not knowing that I was going to be asked from time to time to speak. But I think that um, I think that I'm energetic because it's so exciting. It's just so exciting, and I'm very, very. I feel very, very uh, privileged and honored to be a part of this field. Thank you very much, uh, Margaret. I think this is a wonderful uh, way of ending this wonderful long distance chat. Uh, I thank you so much for taking your time and for sharing very personal. Views. I think young people will very carefully listen what you have to say, and senior people will also very carefully listen to you, what you have to say. You are, you have the overview of the field, and uh, so thank you so much uh, for being with us. Thank you so much, Margaret. Mahalo nui loa, which in Hawaiian is thank you very much and warmest aloha.